this is our text as we continue through the journey of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ and fittingly our text for our communion time together this morning. At each of the tables, uh, you'll notice there's also water. Uh, please help yourself uh, at any time. Also, kids, uh, open those bags, and while you listen in, there's some things that may uh, keep you uh, occupied and uh, enjoying uh, our worship time together. Mark chapter 6 is uh, where we start off today as we prepare in just a few minutes to come to the communion table. Well, the story is told of a couple lumberjacks. Lumberjacks are guys, can be women too. They work out in the woods, they chop trees down. Well, two lumberjacks decided to have a bit of competition with one another. Which one of them could chop down the most uh, number of trees in an eight-hour shift? We got a young guy fresh out of school, fresh out of college, and we've got a bouncing phone here. We'll give that a shot again. Really looking forward to that new technology coming in. Okay, so we got a young guy over here, fresh out of college, a lot of energy, a lot of enthusiasm. We've got an older guy here, experienced. He's been a lumberjack out in the woods, cutting trees down for decades. So who's gonna come out on top? Eight hours, the contest begins, it's over, and they start the count. The young man has chopped down 25 trees. Pretty impressive for eight hours. He thinks he's got it in the bag. Youth and energy have won the day. But it's time to count the older, experienced gentlemen. They begin to count. 18, 19, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. The older gentleman wins in almost a landslide. Well, the young guy is uh, bewildered, surprised, impressed. He said, I don't understand. I didn't stop chopping trees all day. I gave up my all. I gave up my energy. I'm stronger and have more energy than you. How is it that you came out on top, especially when you took a break every hour? The experienced lumberjack said, yes, every hour I sat down for 10 minutes. In that 10 minute time, I gave my body time to recharge. During that time, I sharpened my ax blade so that it was ready to chop the trees for the next 50 minutes. You are strong. You were active. But I was more productive today because of a recharged body and a readied blade. As we come to the text this morning, we'll see that theme uh, in uh, our study, the importance of a recharged body, the importance of a readied blade. We need to rest. We need to replenish our energy, but we need to use that energy for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are a number of valuable insights for everyone who desires to be effective and productive with the life that God has given them. We must sit well. We must swing well. Energy, effort, equipment, and endurance must all blend for there to be progress. Our truth for today from this text, strong people rest so they can remain productively strong. And that is our calling as disciples, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Before us, we have a story, a narrative involving the Lord Jesus Christ, his disciples, and a crowd in general. So let's look at the story from five parts, and then we'll look at two to three applications, lessons, at the end of the story. Our story picks up in Mark 6. Jesus was going around the villages and he continued teaching. We see before he's been rejected in his own town, in his own hometown. It does not stop him. He continues to go forward. He keeps on teaching in the surrounding villages. And in verse 7, he summoned the 12 and he began to send them out in 
in pairs, giving them authority over the unclean spirits. And he instructed them on how, what they should do and how they should do it. They are sent out in small teams, not as, not as a whole. They're sent out to preach, teach, heal, exercise demons as, a, as the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they go out. And then we drop into verse 30, which is the beginning of our text today. The apostles gathered together with Jesus. And they reported to Jesus all that they had done and taught. The plan. Go out. Represent Christ. They are summoned. They are sent now they are brought back to give a summary of their trip, of their experiences, what's been accomplished. They, re they return to report on their assigned tasks. In verse 30, we, we see them, the 12, referenced as apostles, I believe for the first time in the gospel account. They are unique in one sense, uh, hand-selected by the Lord Jesus Christ. But as we watch uh, their, their performance, as we listen in on the plan, we find valuable instruction for all of us as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the, the apostles, these 12 disciples, they're new on the job. For a long time, they've been kind of along for the ride, watching Jesus do Jesus, watching Jesus be Jesus, healing, teaching, his ministry, and they, they kind of had the front row seats. They're in the splash zone, enjoying the box seats to all the activity, watching Jesus do what he's doing. Now they've been sent out to represent Christ and to a certain extent doing what he is doing. But they're new on the job. And like for all of us, when we're new on the job, there's a, a learning curve. There, there's a time of being uncomfortable being new at it, figuring it out, and being a bit uncomfortable with, with it all. This has been a stretching time. Now, the stretching time involved activity. It involved doing. It was also a very demanding time. They are representing Christ on the front lines. Uh, they are going to receive the hostility. They may receive the, the, the facial up front in your face rejection. It's a demanding time. It's also a draining time. Doing ministry for Christ, following Christ, being on mission for Christ is intense spiritual warfare. This is not easy street. And may we never forget that as a church, we are at war. We have an enemy. The enemy shoots real bullets. And we must not forget that. We must not forget that we have an enemy. We must, must not forget who the enemy is, and we must also remember who the enemy is not. As we look out at the world, as we watch the news, as we see things going on that disturb us, concern us, or we say that's not right, something doesn't, doesn't track with the scriptures, may we remember that we, when we encounter people who are not walking with God, living for God, representing God well, they are not the enemy. They are prisoners of the enemy who need to be freed, not condemned. And that is our calling. That's our mission in life, to represent Jesus, to take the liberating news of Jesus out into a culture that needs to be redefined and redirected and remade in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Being on mission for Christ is draining. And if you came in here with a sense of being drained and energy, energy depleted this morning, that is a good thing. You see, when we live the Christian life, it is draining. And if we are not drained, we may not be doing all that God has called us to do, which will hurt everybody. Hurts the people within the body of Christ, but could hurt the culture as a whole. So in our, 
living for Christ, there is a doing active aspect to it that challenges all of us. A demanding aspect. There's also a depending aspect to it. As the disciples went out, they did not go out as a group of 12. They went out in pairs. And the Lord Jesus Christ was not physically with them, physically present. They're on their own to a certain extent. And they are going to be learning how much they must depend on Jesus. Which is a great lesson for me, a great lesson for all of us. How desperately we need Christ. You see, we're created beings, which means we are limited. I don't have all I need. You don't have all you need. Or we have a breaking point. We have a point where the tank runs empty. We desperately need Christ and to be filled with his energy presence all the time. The fact that we even need rest is a reminder how dependent we are on him. Psalm 121, verse 4, reminds us that our Lord and Savior never sleeps or never slumbers. But we need to sleep. We need to rest. Well, the plan is go out, represent Christ, come back, give a report. Let's look at the second part of the story in verse 31. Verse 30, the apostles gathered together with Jesus. They reported to him all that they had done, all that they had taught. And Jesus said to them, come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest for a while. Here's the proposal. You need rest. We need rest need rest. The disciples need a recreation for the missions that still lay ahead. Those missions are going to be essentially the same, preaching, teaching, evangelizing, healing, exercising, representing Christ, basically the same, but there'll be more and more, several lessons, and they need to be recreated again and again for those lessons. Let's notice how Jesus refreshes his servants. He says, it's time for a slowdown. He refreshes his servants with a slowdown. This slowdown, first of all, is a time to resupply. Come, let's rest a while. There had, were many people coming and going, the next verse, and they did not even have time to eat. Have you ever been so busy you, you don't have time to eat? <sighs> there are times to be so busy you don't have time to eat. And these guys have been in one of those times. It has been so intense. There has not been the time to take care of their physical needs. If we do not nourish our bodies... They will fall apart. You know, we can skip a meal and survive the day. We can skip a night of slumber and do an all-nighter to, to study for a final the next day or to write that term paper that's due the next day. And we can do that for a moment, for a day, but you can't do it forever. You can only drive so far on an empty tank. And today is our opportunity as we come together and study the word of God, a time to, to fill up our spiritual tank. And in a sense, we are filling up today for the days ahead. Not for last week, but for the assignments and activities that lay ahead of us over this next week. So Jesus refreshes his servants with a slowdown. It's time to resupply. Also, it is time to refocus Look what we read here. There were many people coming and going. Coming, going. Coming, going. There's a crowd everywhere. They are continually dealing with crowds. As Jesus interacts in the different communities, he draws a crowd. And often it, they're curious to see what's going on, to, to benefit from some of Jesus' miracles. Crowds everywhere. 
Busyness, busyness, busyness. It's so easy to have the vision clouded in, a, in a, an environment of busyness. NFL quarterbacks, as they talk about who's successful and who's not, the ones who are su successful are the ones who adapt and learn how to handle the busyness, the fast pace of the game. And as people are coming at them, they can still see the play developing. They still know what the target is, the goal is. They're trusting their teammates. The successful ones, the game in a sense slows down and they keep doing what they're called to do. And as followers of Jesus, it's kind of that same sense. It's so easy to lose sight of reality, lose sight of the mission in the busyness of life, in the congestion of life when the crowd is coming at us, maybe in a hostile sense or maybe just in a, the busyness of everyday life. We need to keep sight of the mission. We talk about the mission of a disciple of Jesus and the mission of our church quite a bit here. We, we say it in several different ways, but let me, let me give you just two cents or two succinct statements of our mission. What are we about? We follow Christ and we take as many people with us as possible. We follow Jesus wherever he goes. We follow Jesus wherever he sends us or go wherever he sends us. We follow him and, and walk in his steps. And we seek to take as many people with us as possible. Time to resupply physical needs. Time to refocus on the, the mission, the big picture. And thirdly, a time to recharge. Look at verse 32. They went away in the boat to a secluded place by themselves. Now, as you read through the whole story and the parallel passages, we are reminded that the disciples did not go off by themselves and leave Jesus back on the far shore. They are in this crowd, crowd of activity. It's been intense, and Jesus said, let's go to the other side. They get in a boat, and they go to the other side. Jesus is with them in the boat. He says, I want you guys to come with me, and we are going to get away from everybody else for a bit of time to resupply, refocus, recharge. The key in all this is they are always with Jesus Christ. Never absent, never alienated. The greater the demand in ministry, the draining demands of ministry, the more essential it is for us to be close to Jesus. And when you're busy and when there's lots of activity going on, it is so essential for us to keep focus and keep growing in our relationship with Jesus Christ. The plan, the proposal, rest. Notice the third part in verse 33, all as it blends together. Let's look at the popularity of Christ in all of this. Here's the plan. Get away, have some downtime, charge up the batteries. But we've got a problem. The disciples have a problem. Jesus sort of has a problem. And so I think we can relate in the problems of life and the challenges of life. Verse 33, the people saw them, the disciples and Jesus, going. They recognized them and they ran together on foot from all the cities and they got there ahead of the disciples and Jesus. The disciples and Jesus are with the crowd on one side of the lake. Jesus said, let's go to the other side of the lake to get away from the crowd. Sounds like a great idea. And so they do that, but here's the problem. Somehow the crowd is faster than the guys in the boat. And the crowd goes about eight miles distance, while the guys who are in the boat go four miles distance. There may have been some wind that was uh, hindering the boats, slowing the boats down, or maybe the wind died down, and so they didn't have the, the sail power to go to the other side. We don't know exactly, but this crowd is quick. They are faster. 
And they get to the other side, and you know, they, the disciples are looking forward to this downtime, and they get to shore, and what do they encounter? All the people that are trying to leave. Have you ever tried to go on a vacation? You're look, looking forward to getting away from it all, like maybe all the stuff at the office, the boss at the office, uh, the neighbors, and you get to your destination. Imagine that, and there they all are waiting for you. I mean, we, we might be a little bummed, might be a little ticked, discouraged. It's like, what are you guys doing here? You're in the wrong place. We did not want you here. There is so much for us to learn about as we watch how Christ handles this situation, how he handles the crowd. The slowdown is very short. We thought it was going to last long. The disciples thought it was going to last longer, and it's, it's just a quick boat ride. And it's over. Notice what Jesus does in verse th uh, 34. They get to the other side of the lake, and there they are. And I guess if it was me, I might turn, boat, turn the boat back. <laughs> Let's take our shot going the other side of the lake. I'm tempted to turn around because I'm really looking forward to my downtime. Jesus went ashore. He got out of the boat and he engaged the crowd. And he saw the large crowd. As he saw it, he felt compassion for them. Like a sheep, they were like sheep without a shepherd. You want to do some digging, have an interesting study, you can trace that phrase back into the Old Testament. Uh, there's some uh, prophetic elements in a picture of who Christ is. He is a shepherd who is interested in the sheep and interested in the shepherdless sheep. So he engages them and he began to teach them many things. The slowdown is quite short. It reminds all of us that there's a place for rest, but the pursuit of rest must never become an idol. It reminds us that while the pursuit of rest, rest has its place, the pursuit of it must never become escapism from a life of responsibility, a life of doing uh, what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. There is a place for rest stops and a need for rest stops in our life. It's a good place to refocus, recharge, readjust, but only for a short time. There's work to be done, people to be engaged, assignments to fulfill. Jesus handles the crowd invading his downtime with the compassion of, te with the compassion of teaching eternal truth. What was Jesus all about? He was all about teaching. The miracles before the teaching, the miracles after the teaching, as in this case, are all to highlight, accentuate, spotlight, and support the teaching ministry. Here we catch the mission priority of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's become uh, rather trendy in our current culture for the culture to criticize uh, any church that emphasizes, emphasizes the teaching of Scripture. And I'm reminded, and we should all be reminded, of the danger of being critical about what Jesus modeled. A word of caution for us as a church as well. Christ's compassion and teaching here is also connected with an outstanding miracle, the, the, the feeding of the 5,000. Christ's truth always connects with Christ's heart of compassion and his heart of compassion always connects to eternal truth. And we need to be careful not to criticize anything that Jesus modeled. And we need to model all that Jesus modeled. And he modeled teaching truth with a compassionate, practical, active heart. The popularity of Jesus is now intertwined with what we'll call the picnic. The feeding of the 5,000, one of the more popular stories in all of uh, the Word of God and the life of Jesus Christ. It is highlighted and spotlighted in all four Gospels. 
as you work your way through it, it cannot be exp- re- explained away as a, as, a, as a moment of intense sharing amongst the group. It cannot be ex- the supernatural aspect of it cannot be explained away by it was just figurative. What Jesus did here was feed to a point of fully, full satisfaction between 15 and 20,000 people with five fish and two biscuits. It's truth in action, it's love in display, and it demands a verdict. All four gospel writers in highlighting this, in teaching this, paint us into a corner. We cannot explain Jesus away as a nice example, as a soft philosophy. We are painted into a corner where we must answer the question, who is this man? As we come to the communion table in just a moment, this is our declaration of what we believe and who we believe this man is. Our text tells us that this is God the Son who died for me, who lives for me, and lives in me as I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. What's it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ, to be a disciple of Jesus? It means that we understand that Jesus claimed to be God. We believe that Jesus is God. And what he did on the cross takes care of our sin problem. And we have repented of our sin and accepted the full pardon that Jesus Christ offers to us. And we are declaring in our life and at this table, I belong to Jesus. When we come to the last part of this story, we drop into verse 41. We won't discuss all the details of the feeding of the 5,000 today. But as we come to the end of that, this story... We have a very beautiful picture for us that's going to picture what we're about to do in a moment. Verse 39, Jesus commanded everyone to sit down by groups on the green grass. So we know it's springtime there in the land of Israel. They sat down in groups. And verse 41, Jesus took the five loaves, the two fish, He looked up to heaven, he blessed the food, he broke the loaves, and he kept giving it to the disciples, who kept giving it to the people, who kept eating until they were fully satisfied. Jesus took, Jesus blessed, Jesus broke. He took, he blessed, and he broke. I invite you to turn over to chapter 14 of this gospel with me. Mark 14 and verse 22. The picnic on the hill anticipates what we read now, anticipates what we do now. The communion, the final Passover, the first communion, the last supper. Verse 22, Mark 14. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to them and said, Take it, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup, he gave thanks, and he said to them, He gave it to them, and they drank from it. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many. couple lessons for us as we come to the table. We are to stay busy doing God's priorities. There's work to be done. It will be demanding. It will be draining. We need to depend on him. He will always be faithful. We are not to be so busy that we fail to find ourselves at the feet of Jesus Christ broken and blessed, refreshed, refocused, rejuvenated. Strong people rest 
so they can remain productively strong. And our target this week is to have a recharged body mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually. And to have a ready blade and to be swinging it again and again productively for the kingdom. For our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is alive. And for us as followers of Jesus, he's alive in us. And so we sit with a purpose and we sit, swing with a purpose and we even smile with a purpose. I invite you to just bow your heads and take a moment or two of reflection And let the Spirit of God speak into your life as I invite him to speak into my life. It's kind of the report time where we look back and of what's happened. And so we come to the table, we rest, and we take steps forward for Jesus. Father, thank you for your invitation to go with you to a secluded spot in our thinking and in our memories in this moment. We look back and there are probably some things that are very encouraging for us. We think of victories, we think of progress, And yet, as we look back, there are probably some things that we regret, some things we wish we could do over, some things we need to repent of. But as we repent, we are reminded of your truth that you wash us, that you clean us. And in that process, you renew us for your mission ahead. So we come with repentant hearts, we come with thankful hearts. We receive your cleansing, and we receive the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is in his name that we pray. Amen.